Um, but yeah, I'm not sure where exactly to start. I think I'll start a little bit with uh, an interview that Jackie and I did about a week ago uh, here at the local radio station talking about this show, um, Tradition and Innovation, and talking about how creativity is something that is really important in my life and something that I think is a really wonderful gift that you know humanity has, um, not only for creating you know visually uh, beautiful and inspiring works that are a reflection of our existence, um, which you know is wonderful in its own right, but also creativity as a way for human beings to solve problems, and that's largely where. I feel like the direction of my work is going, um, and in particular with this title, you know, Tradition and Innovation. So a little backstory on my work, um, as Jackie mentioned, having a relationship with Sheldon Jackson Museum with my art career, I think since about 2011, um, might've been 2012, but I think it was about 2011 when I started to demonstrate. Uh, and as a, as a child and a young adult, also going to the museum uh, for connection and inspiration, looking at the objects and being very um, moved by a lot of them. Uh, in particular, one that really stands out is the seal dagger. And it was just beautifully constructed with this wooden head of a seal uh, on this dagger that's used um, for kind of ending this life. And, I think about the connection in objects that were kind of used every day and objects that are used every day uh, and those not being art just for art's sake, but kind of a part, you know, of the whole. And so some of my artwork isn't so much uh, functional um, as, it, as it was rooted and inspired into tradition and functionality. Um, but I feel like it's functional in the component, in the context of being like relevant and surviving today, um, just as the many generations of my ancestors have practiced their traditional art forms in their contemporary time. I'm continuing and practicing this traditional art form in this contemporary time. So having some of my items and objects uh, besides my art into the show was also fun. So I don't have a lot of photos uh, really of those items. They're at in the museum, uh, but I'll tell you some of them. They're like daily objects that I think a lot of people, you know, will recognize. Like I have some spark, I have a spark plug, um, have a, drain plug for the boat. I've got a starter coil that went out in my uh, outboard motor one time when I was on the water. Fortunately, it wasn't far from town. Um, and I got a tow from Terry Prancevich and that was very nice of him. Um, and like an iPhone case. And then I have objects that are more modern hunting tools, uh, a rifle, uh, a skinny knife, um, I got a snag hook that I use when I go seal hunting because often seals will sink. So I use the snag hook uh, to snag them up from the bottom if I can find them and recover them that way. And then I have some sewing items yeah, that I use, different thread and sewing needles, scissors, things like that. And then I have some objects that, that I created. Um, I wanted to include those, you know, part to show that I am a part of a, a living culture. You know, um, I think as an indigenous artist, we really get boxed into a lot of stereotypes and preconceived notions. And I think as an indigenous person and a person of color, uh, one of the challenges is not being viewed as fully human, um, you know, which is 
part of the American history, um, which goes into the Declaration of Independence uh, being referred to as savages. It goes into um, we the people and being excluded from that. So it's, um, you know, a very long history uh, of policy and that continues today. And it's very much alive um, today. And even in broader society views of having to justify uh, my cultural existence, you know, in the moment. And so hearing various things like, why do I use a rifle uh, on a traditional hunt? or people criticizing my use of fashion. Um, and so, you know, when I interact with folks at times when I'm demonstrating and interacting with the public, I'm kind of, you know, taken aback by their stance. Um, and so often, you know, one thing that I like to point out is that they have this critique, but they expect me to respond in the English language, you know, and they don't question that I have a bank account, um, but they question that I'm using a rifle or a motorboat on a traditional hunt. So with that being said, I think that's also why I think it's important to include those items into this show um, to show that I'm a part of a living culture. Um, and as living things do, we grow and we change and we adapt as we need to, which goes back to the title. So um, if we could show some of the, the photos, maybe just like pull up one and then we'll leave it on the screen for a bit. You can just start in the beginning of that folder um, if you can share those. And so I'm mostly known for my fashion work, as I mentioned with seals and sea otters, which seemed like a natural place for me to do my work and continue my traditional art practice of hand sewing. And it seemed like a way to perpetuate this culture by sharing it uh, and educating folks, both Alaska Native and non-Alaska Native, but also as a way to make money, um, which we have to do, uh, you know, to survive now. <laughs> so, <clears throat> In doing such, I had a lot of uh, obstacles with trying to get into the high-end fashion industry um, and also outside of Alaska, uh, there are so many different obstacles and cultural differences and divides for me to kind of overcome. And it was very exhausting. And I felt like I kind of hit a wall for a bit with that. And so in taking some time to kind of think about how to move forward with this cultural practice that has given so much to me and is so much of a gift from my ancestors on a level that it's even hard for me to put into verbal context of how important and inspiring and healing and uplifting these cultural practices are and wanting to keep them alive for future generations. Because again, it's the gift of my ancestors. So as someone who, you know, quoting the late and great Terry Rothgar about, and I'm gonna be paraphrasing a little bit, but about how, you know, she doesn't like own the culture. She just gets to hold it for a little while and pass it on. Um, I think that's just such a beautiful way of describing being a cultural bearer and practicing a cultural um, art form and way of life in the present moment that we get to hold it just for a little while and then pass it on. And so there's a lot of responsibility with that. And there's uh, at times, you know, a lot of joy and a lot of heaviness. And so the way I was trying to keep it alive wasn't seeming to really work out. And so I thought about what are what are some other things I can do going back to art and creativity is also a way to solve problems. And so I was thinking that perhaps getting into museum spaces 
and art spaces might be easier to communicate messages and the work that I'm doing versus trying to do that in a retail fashion setting. Um, because a lot of the work and conversations that I'm having kind of do this whack-a-mole effect of people asking, asking and thinking one thing and then another and the next thing and another and another. And it's almost this endless um, back and forth. So <clears throat> as much as I value having those conversations to a degree, and I say to a degree, because I think they're very important conversations to have about um, culture, place, things that we use in our life every day, uh, life that gives, a, gives us you know, the ability to stay alive by its death. I think those things are so important for us to talk about in a culture. Also, what I found was that it was very exhausting for me to do so constantly like on a one-on-one -on -one basis and also in kind of almost an uncontrolled way where I'm never quite sure what's gonna happen. So with that in mind, I was thinking of starting to create artworks that the pieces themselves start to address some of the question, some of these frequently asked questions. And so that that dialogue can continue, but hopefully without as much kind of effort and continual effort and one-on-one -on -one effort on my end, but to be able to educate in a form that means that I don't have to actually kind of have to continue redoing this labor or continuing to have these same oppressive conversations, which are also perpetuating forms of violence. So I was thinking that through object creation is a way to do that. And so to give a little more backstory about like the object creation, um, Again, as I mentioned, trying to transition a little bit from fur and I was thinking, well, what if I create these like kind of these tapestries? If we go maybe like two, two slides ahead here. Um, so I was thinking like, what if I take this fur that I'm working with and I sew basically kind of like a, a tapestry and I stretch it over canvas stretcher bar like you would a painting. And so start to call them for paintings and using um, light and uh, the shapes and the shadings and the colors of these pieces as basically the visual artistic medium. Um, and so these are the earlier ones that I started to experiment that with. Uh, and these are at the museum. So this is seal, harbor seal, sea otter, uh, and sheared sea otter that I sheared it with scissors. And so I stretched it not over a canvas stretcher bar here, but I stretched it over uh, an old frame. And so that's what I first started them with. Uh, here's some detail in the fur. And so I thought that this might be a really good way to engage people and think about how the museum has, museum space in the past has been a place that has been supportive of my work. And it seems like a place that people are going with kind of the idea and the intention to learn something, you know, and, and in art spaces, it seems like often there's intention to be challenged. And so I thought that this would be a good place to try to continue uh, my culture so to innovate and you know, keep the traditions going uh, in these contemporary spaces. So this, these are again, earlier pieces that I've done. This one's out of a seal skin called camouflage. And it was one of the first ones that I did that I really thought that I kind of had something um, as I was experimenting with them before I just kind of didn't know what I was doing. But when I saw this one, I felt like there was something there. And then also my um, kind of like my reaction that I got from people that I started to share this work with was also very positive. And so early on in the show, in, 
excuse me, early on in these pieces, I was still kind of looking for direction um, and <clears throat> trying to find my voice, so to speak. So initially it was more about doing this idea instead of what am I going to use message wise? And I guess like to back up a little bit about that too, with my work and one of the challenges that I thought, or one of the challenges I came across was, is that my work is so um, experiential and intention driven from like the night or day before, you know, I pack my gear to go hunting and send out my intentions to the animals, to my smudging and praying in the morning to going out on the water and asking the animal for its life and giving this last drink of water, which at the show I have in one of the cases at the museum, I have one of my water bottles that I use. And so it's so intention-based and then going through processes of, of tanning, you know, like skinning and tanning, stretching the hide and then hand sewing each piece. There's a lot of intention behind my work. And to me, that that's like very uh, important and my relationship with the materials that I use is very important. And so I felt that that was a very strong piece of what my work represents. And so whether it's in the form of a pencil skirt or a scarf or earmuffs or mittens, to me, that's a part of the art. And it was something that was challenging uh, to convey in that context. So this is also something that I'm experimenting with now, which is fish skin. And so these are uh, sockeye salmon um, that we dip netted at Readout. And I just did a simple home tanning of these skins. So it's vegetable oil, water, uh, and Dr. Bronner's. And I sewed it. Um, with dental floss. And I'll show a couple of angles here. Uh, this is on a, on a stretcher bar, like 12 inch by 12 inch, and I think like three quarter inch deep stretcher bar. I used some wool herringbone fabric uh, from, that I had left over from making uh, garment pieces. And so I sewed them together and this piece is called Silhouette. And um, I'm using it to talk about subsistence lifestyle and also the policies, um, oppressive anti-native policies that have impacted this traditional lifestyle. Um, so this, this piece kind of the write up is talking about how we used to have a food economy um, and the forest service burnt down essentially our banks, which was our smoke houses. Um, and that wasn't that long ago. And there's a lot of you know, current uh, policy that is still you know, genocidal in its nature. Um, and so I'm starting to use these pieces um, to kind of have these broader conversations now. Um, these are just some detail of like the scales and um, repurposed dental floss. Um, throughout the years, people would ask me what I use, especially like when I'm demonstrating art to visitors. And I would say, you know, just use something strong and waxy, dental floss could work. Um, cause that's kind of, you know, where <laughs> it was kind of like, uh, you know, modern sinew. Um, and so I thought, well, what if I kind of save my dental floss, which will also help me, uh, encourage me to hopefully to floss more consistently. Um, but also to be a little more in line with also what I'm trying to do, um, artistically with my practice. So there's like a little bit more um, just details of, of this piece. Um, and then in the show, uh, we have some of, of my gear um, included a hunting rifle and this life jacket and these earmuffs uh, are also displayed. And if we could go, if you could show the beginning, the beginning two um, photos where we started off going with the the television set. 
So just like take a moment to pull that up. But that piece is talking about kind of the replacement of kind of the seal oil lamp, you know, and this kind of cultural replacement um, by like the television and the lack of cultural representation and ability to kind of control our own narrative, um, which is a struggle that I've come across a lot with my, with my work. And um, so this, this is a piece, it's a, it's a gutted um, television set, so it's pretty lightweight. And I looked up the pattern for the color bars because uh, apparently there is like a system. And so I tried to mimic that um, with the dimensions and the different tones and colors within the seal skins. Because uh, there seems to be about like kind of five or six different kind of tones and harbor seals. So I mixed those up here and sewed those all together. And I sewed those pieces to Velcro and then put the other like sticky side of the Velcro inside the television set. So that piece could kind of be um, removed if it needed to be for some reason. I also had the idea of kind of being able to take the, the television set apart if I needed to be to ship it somewhere. Um, but I happened to strip one of the screws um, while creating it. So the television set is kind of, uh, at the moment kind of stuck together like that. Um, but it was a piece that when the State Museum and um, the Sheldon Jackson Museum was reviewing my works, it was a piece that the committee, uh, it really spoke to the committee and it happens to have a pretty centered piece uh, or place I should say in the show. Um, so that being said, I also kind of forgot to mention, just like giving my thanks to the Sheldon Jackson Museum, to Jackie and Robert, who have been working really hard on putting things together. Uh, and then also thanks to the Alaska State Museum, um, where Jackie Manning over there and Addison have been working really hard and fabricating some really beautiful um, display cases. And this has been a really wonderful learning experience for myself um, as I'm trying to branch into kind of different uh, venues and areas to continue my work and my message. And so it's very exciting to be able to have a sh solo show at Sheldon Jackson Museum and at a museum. And um, that significance is not lost on me. And I'm very appreciative of that. And I hope that uh, it continues and grows. Um, so that being said, we'll check in with Jackie to see how we're doing on time. Well, we're doing fine. You can um, open it up for questions if you wish, Peter, you're welcome to do that. And um, we can unmute folks if that's what you'd like to do. Sure, um, do you have the actual time? I don't of see course, that, it's 3.30. Okay, yeah, well, how about we do that? Um, that'd be great. Okay, Maybe just a second sure. then. Okay, so everyone is able to unmute themselves now if they wish. Unmute. Good afternoon, Peter. Um, my question is, are you gonna continue with the 
your sewing of the animal furs? Are you gonna? Are you still doing any of your paintings? Because we do have quite a collection of your earlier paintings, which I do love. Way back when. <laughs> Thanks for all your work. Hmm. Thank you, Bernadette and Daryl, for that. Uh, it's so good your faces it makes me want to cry <laughs> in a good way <laughs> um, <laughs> it's really wonderful to see you both uh thank you for that question um because it that is something that i'm also transitioning with a bit where i am working with fur um, but i am transitioning into more focus with fish skin and so that's why i spent some time showing that one and I'm focusing on fish skin as a way to try to see if I can have a conversation, the same kind of conversation I wanna have, but maybe in a more effective way with something like fish. And like, so that, you know, Nirvana lyric, it's okay to eat fish because fish don't have any feelings, you know, which I think is a very ironic, you know, I think he meant it, you know, ironically, um, but it's also something that I'm playing with the audience to see if this is accepted, if seals or sea otters is something that is like kind of not accepted for me to use or eat or to sew with is um, using salmon skin, you know, is, the, is salmon okay then for me to, to eat and sew with. Um, so kind of like playing a little bit with the audience, but also trying to find a way to be more effective, um, I think with what I'm trying to do and, and where there's not the same kind of preconceived notions or a lot of the the unknown and I guess there are some legit you know a lot of legit questions that come with me working with seal or sea otter with someone who's seen that for the first time um, but it just gets to a point where I think it's kind of suffocating and stifling when I have to continually address them so as a way to try to get around that I um, am working with salmon skin and then to get what you're saying with painting I'm actually thinking of actually starting to paint on them uh, and I haven't, I haven't done it yet, but I'm thinking of trying to make some natural paints. And so uh, I've been talking to some folks. Um, Tommy Joseph is someone who I've been talking to a bit about um, natural paint making, um, going down at Think at Anihiti, also known as Sika National Historical Park, has a display um, there that shows how some natural paints were made. I've been reading on some Yupik um, mask making where some, how some kind of the paints were made for there. So I think that's something that I'm gonna experiment on. And I've been thinking about that and thinking about that also trying to paint on the fish skin and make it more directed to climate change. So Jackie mentioned how um, a lot of my work is also environmental focused. And so also within the sea otter conversation, it's so interesting, like I enjoy, like enjoyed being able to talk about so many different things with sea otters and the ecological collapse um, of them was something that I think is an important, you know, component um, to talk, to talk about and to talk about like that as a danger and a warning system, but also as an example of a way to have reciprocity and a way to have a level of take and harvest um, that can also sustain, you know, both that we don't have to go to one extreme or the other. Um, so now I'm being a little more focused on climate change and the, in particular, severe impacts that it's having and going to have on Alaska Native food systems. Um, and so salmon also being a way, like the salmon skin being a way to do that. And I'm thinking about trying to paint uh, on the salmon skin to try to have more conversations around climate change, but it's, also something challenging that I'm trying to think, how do I do that in a way that is also inviting to people? Um, how do I do it in a way that, um, because it is such, you know, it's ecocide and it's, and it's these horrible, horrible things that is happening to the planet. And it's so easy to get overwhelmed and discouraged with what's going on because it's horrific. Um, but at the same time, how do we, how do we kind of talk about it without, being so overwhelmed. So how do I how do I make kind of climate change beautiful uh, in a way? You know, um, not that it's completely beautiful, but meaning I guess visually, you know, aesthetically. How do I make um, something kind of aesthetically pleasing that can 
draw people in to have conversations about some really um, ugly things. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I'll ask a question, Peter. This is Jackie. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the upcoming exhibitions that you've got on your calendar? Any other shows coming up for you? Any travel? Yeah, um, thanks for that, Jackie. I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll also talk about some other projects that I got going on. Um, so I have in theory, uh, a show at all my relations art in Minneapolis. Um, and that I say kind of in theory, just, I guess like I have it, it's just up in air and it's, it's, it's changing, um, Down here. it's just changing because of, uh, because of the pandemic. So, um, the date has been moved back and forth, um, but that's something that's coming up and it should be coming up this year, maybe April or um, you know early summer, but we'll just see how things can continue with the pandemic. So that's one. And then uh, a group show um, at museum, um, at MOCA, the IAI Museum in um, Santa Fe uh, with some fashion pieces. And then I haven't I haven't been applying to other things yet, but I hope to um, start doing that soon. I've kind of just been waiting a little bit before I start applying to things because it just feels it feels kind of I don't know it just feels kind of weird to try to apply to a gallery space right now. Um, although maybe I should be kind of doing that because it does take like a year or two uh, for once once a show is. Kind of accepted it takes a while to put that get that show together um so those are kind of the shows i've got going on as far as travel i used to travel a lot with my work i'm trying to not travel so much now um and so it's challenging because i really you know enjoy traveling but also uh, i want to just try to take more responsibility with limiting my carbon footprint um, and again, that's like also really hard because it's this, these broader systemic issues largely at play and that there are, you know, I could like never fly again, um, but it doesn't compare to, you know, a huge corporate um, polluter or, you know, a tanker that's just like dumping, you know, so much um, carbon into the atmosphere. So that's something that I'm also trying to kind of navigate for myself. Um, you know, I'd love to go to Bethel and Akiak. It's been quite a while since I've been there. And I have a lot of questions. I'm starting to try to learn Yuchtun, which is the, the Yupik language. And I think it would really be great to be, you know, kind of immersed in the language. And I have, I have some questions for elders uh, with some of the work that I'm doing. And so I think it would be really great to travel there. So I'm just trying to answer that for myself. I don't really have, I don't have like an answer um, about, you know, when I should travel, when I shouldn't travel. Um, it's not, doesn't seem like an easy, an easy answer solution, but I'm just trying to keep that in mind. And some other projects that I have going on is I've been working on quite a while uh, with my partner, Michael Dempster, on creating a curriculum to go accompany the documentary Harvest, which is being displayed in a loop at the museum. So it's a 20 minute piece. And excuse me, we thought we, when we created it, we thought about trying to get it into schools. Um, and again, there's like so much you can do with talking about sea otters and the history of sea otters and the, and the contemporary use uh, of sea otters. So we're still working, work, working on the second draft of the curriculum. It's the first time that either one of us have worked on a curriculum and, um, really had no idea like how hard of work it is that goes into it. Uh, we also want it to be diverse, which is, which is very challenging. We want it to be used, um, you know, in Alaska to like New York, to California, Washington, uh, Oregon. Those are some places, California, 
that we've targeted in particular because of the history of sea otter or uh, you know the, the presence of sea otter or also um, anti-fur policies that uh, basically infringe upon the Marine Mammal Protection Act exemption for Alaska natives. So we're trying to do that and focus on um, science, although there's a lot of history and Native American studies component to that work. It's also been challenging to try to put kind of indigenous ways of knowing within a Western scientific context um, in, in the form of a curriculum, uh, which has been really challenging and something that we're continuing to work on. Um, I also submitted a teaching proposal to Outer Coast uh, College here in Sitka, uh, which is really awesome this year that they are like actively looking for Alaska Native uh, teachers, uh, students, uh, and subject matter to teach. Um, so yeah, I don't know what will come of that. And, but it is, it would be a really great opportunity to like test this kind of curriculum um, to practice it live with students. Because the ultimate goal with the curriculum is to get it online and have it available for no money. Um, I think I'm gonna try to stop saying free because that's something we used to say free but we want we want teachers to actually really teach it and that is labor you know and that is their time and that is that is something that's not necessarily free and we also want to say that to kind of like protect it copyright but we want to make it available um, for no money and so those are those are the big some big projects that i'm been working on and hoping to wrap up really busy Thank you, Peter. Um, any more questions? We can probably take uh, one or two more before we wrap up. Hello, Peter. We can hear you. Hello. Uh, this, this is Judy Lehman. And I was wondering, are you using any other skins other than salmon? Hey, Judy. Thanks for the question. Um, I am, I'm using some um, halibut that I got this summer. And I'm also experimenting with some natural tanning techniques. So okay. I'm pretty familiar with the commercial tanning that I've done at Sika Tribal Tannery. So like knowing those kind of techniques, but I'm wanting to learn more traditional ones. And so I did do some willow bark um, tanning with some halibut that I got this, this past summer. And I um, see what else have I got. Uh, we caught some skate and so we ate that and saving the skin. Um, I haven't I haven't tried to tan it yet. I've taken some classes and I've heard um, from Hannah Scholl. She's uh, Supiak based in Kodiak and she um, did some online tan some online tanning classes and talked about having problems with some rockfish. So I think really? the more, yeah. So I think the more that I try kind of different skins, I guess they're all kind of just different. Mm -hmm. um, have you, have you done? Yes, I've done a, a lot. Rockfish uh, has worked mm -hmm. out very well for me. Ling cod is kind of a challenge mm -hmm. and I'm trying to use more natural um, barks. Uh, I've even used salmon eggs in my tanning. So th there's a lot of things. And then the other question I have, have you used any natural dyes? We were talking about painting. Yeah, I, I haven't um, yet. Uh, the willow bark did some um, kind of a peachish, almost tan. Um, I'm going to go grab a piece. Um, so this is, this is a piece of coho salmon. Yeah. Um, and so it kind of has this brown um, Alder, from the willow. Alder works very good too. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen I've seen some kind of the like the red or like the dark from the mm -hmm. alder. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what other. Oh, um, uh, June Pardue. Uh, I don't know if you right. had a chance. She's excellent. She's excellent. Yeah. So when she was at the Sheldon Jackson Museum this past summer, I had a moment to talk with her, and that's who I got the willow bark tanning recipe from. And she showed some of her willow bark tanning that she did with the tips, like the, um, the early growth um, leaves. Mm -hmm. And it was this 
really beautiful green color <laughs> um, onto the salmon skin. And then I've also talked with some folks um, in Japan who've done some traditional dyeing. Um, I've, I've seen some I've seen some people use beets too, like like the beet skin. Um, I think June did some of that. But um, Judy, what did you on your rock your rockfish? Um, what kind of tanning method worked well for it? Um, I've used uh, well the egg tanning. That's the way I started out. But um, the willow and the alder seems to be working very well. I'm using alder on the salmon skins now, and they turned out lovely. Cool. And then I'm tr trying to use natural dyes. Um, mm -hmm as cochineal and matter, but I'm also trying to use more of like these uh, fungi or the, the lichens and trying that. So there, there, there's just a wealth of things. Uh, I can put you in contact with a friend of mine who's been using lots of natural dyes and she's from Minnesota and um, is uh, from originally from China and she can give you some good ideas too. Cool. On your alder, have you, or I guess your bark tan in general, do you use Thank you for freshly your information. Harvested? This has been fascinating. <laughs> yeah, um, I had a question. On your, when you use bark tanning, do you use the bark freshly harvested or have you tried some bark that you dried um, and or preserved in some way? It was freshly harvested. Okay. That's how I mostly mostly heard of it, but I, I am interested in trying to experiment to see if there if how it would work dried. Um, I've also heard I haven't researched it yet, but bog tanning. Um, hmm. So just basically trying to find a muskeg hole here and uh, and put put some skin in. Um, have, have you heard of anyone doing bog tanning? That sounds fascinating. <laughs> I'd love to try that. <laughs> cool. Well, Jackie, how are we on time? Thanks for that, Judy. Thank you. I'm sure. So it's um, 3.47, so we should probably wrap up. But uh, Judy and Peter and anybody else interested, Ellen Carley, the conservator at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau, has been doing some interesting work looking at dyes with a group of Chilkat weavers. If anyone's interested in that, there might be some crossover there. So really nice little connection there. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And Peter, this was just great. Please come see the exhibit if you can. Um, we're open and operating currently Wednesday through Saturday from noon until 4 p.m. So please drop in during operating hours. And if you have any questions, just give us a call at 747-8981. And Peter's the first in a number of artists who will have here hosted for a solo series. So we will have more solo shows. Um, we won't have another one in for another year, more or less. But stay tuned to hear more on that. In the meantime, come see the exhibit. And the Friends Annual Meeting, just so people have it on their calendar, is happening on Saturday, February 6th. And June Pardue, who is a favorite of almost everybody that I know, whose name has come up so much today, wonderful Lutic artist, will be the guest speaker for the Friends during their annual meeting. So she'll be giving a talk right after their brief business meeting. And that um, will all be posted in Alaska State Museum press releases, Friends of Sheldon Jacks Museum website, Facebook, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So stay tuned for links, etc. It will be on Zoom just like this was. So thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Peter, for all your wonderful work and appreciate your time and this wonderful exhibit that you created. Goyana, thank you, everyone. Um, stay safe and maybe it goes without saying, but um, the State Museum, you know, it is run by the state. So they are taking precautions uh, during the pandemic. So masks required and things like that. Um, but stay safe. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks to your assistant, too. I think I know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a nice day. Thanks for being here with us.